All right, good morning, everyone. All right, we're going to go ahead and get started. So let's go to the Lord in prayer, and uh, we'll go ahead and begin. Heavenly Father, uh, we are thankful for another Sunday school hour. Uh, good to get back and to understand uh, a better, have a better understanding at least of the biblical covenants and uh, also the different diversity that we see within uh, the Reformed and Baptists and all that. And so we just pray that you would help us to understand these things, to wrestle with the truths as they are seen in the scriptures, and to be more impressed with uh, how you have the grand drama of redemption all centered around Christ and the redemption that he provides. We thank you for this in Christ's name. Amen. Okay, well, good to be back with everyone. Uh, we're going to look again at uh, Baptist covenant theology. This is one of the distinctives for uh, Baptists, and we see this in our 1689 Confession, which I left in my office. But um, in the first sentence of chapter 7, paragraph 3, we see that it talks about this covenant, which is referring to the covenant of grace, is first revealed in the garden, which we would say is Genesis 3.15, the promise, um, and then by farther steps until the full discovery thereof. Okay? Um, that's coming from memory, so if, if that's a slightly worded differently, let me know. Um, but that's the first sentence there. And this is kind of an explanation, expansion on what... Uh, was in many of the minds of the Baptists during that time, and we know this because we can read their writings and understand how they articulated their covenant theology. So they were not Baptists simply because they saw proof texts in the New Testament and decided, okay, well, we're going we're gonna to slap on baptism to uh, our theology. Um, back then, they had a very robust view of covenant theology, and it was different from the uh, Presbyterian model that was out there as well. And as we said, when it comes to covenant theologies, we want to say covenant theologies, plural. So we're thinking there's, there's diversity. Even within Westminster Federalism, we see diversity. So there's not one monolithic view. So this is a, a picture view of what I want to kind of discuss. We've, we've gone through this in some detail, looking at the various covenants. So today I want us to look at maybe just a little bit of an overview, and we're going to look at the New Covenant or Covenant of Grace as well. So as far as our outworking, remember it says it was revealed, first of all, in the Garden. So the Covenant of Grace, this is the covenant that we're going to say everyone throughout all time, Old Testament, New Testament saint, is saved under. Uh, Christ is the federal head of this covenant. All his benefits are communicated to those who are participants of it. So we'll go through some of those benefits here today as well, which would be salvation, forgiveness of sins, justification, adoption. All these different things we see um, are, are provided for in this covenant with Christ, the federal head. Um, as we've been going, uh, we've been saying just because we see grace in, old, in the Old Testament or Old Covenant doesn't make it the covenant of grace. That's different from what a lot of Presbyterians would look at. Um, and the reason is because we see alongside with all these, there are conditions for enjoying those benefits and blessings. Uh, we saw this in Abraham. We saw this in Moses. We saw this in David. Um, and it's, uh, we would actually see this as Abraham, Moses, David as the Old Covenant as a whole. We talked about also that covenants govern kingdoms. Okay? So covenants govern kingdoms. The kingdom of creation was governed by the covenant of works and a Noahic covenant. The covenant of Israel is governed by the old covenant, which is Abraham, Moses, David. The covenant of the kingdom, the kingdom of Christ, we'll say, is governed by the new covenant slash covenant of grace. That's what we're going to see briefly today. Um, and so what, that, what we see within the 1689 Confession of 7-3, uh, is the farther steps. Okay, So this is the farther steps. With each covenant is a step towards the, the full discovery. Um, now, in that book, we've been looking at this and seeing quotes, The Mystery of Christ, and uh, this is uh, explaining kind of how the mystery is revealed 
through covenants. So throughout, we'll see in this these different covenants, we're learning more and more about Christ, who he's going to be, what kind of savior he's going to be. We learn that he's going to be a prophet, priest, and king by virtue of these covenants. Um, within these covenants, it also there's types. And so we're the Baptists want to also stress, let's look at the first level. What was the first level fulfillment of these types? What were they communicating to the participants of those of that covenant at that time? And then, before, after we see that, let's see what they are in a second level as well. Let's not jump straight to Christ. Let's see it within its context and see how the people understood it at that time. Um, so what we see here is progression. With every step is further progression, and we learn more, and it's leading us to the new covenant promise. So, again, just this isn't a, like a, a big separation here, but just look at, you want to see this as old covenant that governs Israel. Um, Genesis 3.15, we see the infancy of the promise. So another thing that the, the Baptists like to emphasize is the promise revealed doesn't mean the covenant of grace. Promise revealed, in other words, is promising the covenant of grace. So we see Genesis 3.15, and we say the seed who will crush the serpent's head is pointing us forward to the one who will come, who will crush the serpent's head, who will, by his federal headship, communicate all the blessings and benefits to us as we partake in it. That has yet to come. It's not going to, uh, to happen until the blood of the cross. Um, in Noah, this really isn't a, we would say, a salvific covenant. Noah, as we talked about last time, is a covenant with all of creation. It's not for only the elect, right? This is for uh, the elect and non-elect. It's all the world. And this is the foundational layer that which all these other covenants rest on. Because it is through this covenant that God's promising to uphold the earth as long as the earth shall remain, right? He's going to sustain it. There's going to be seasons. There's going to be um, days and, and everything that's going to happen because he's accomplishing his plan of redemption that's going to happen. And the Noahic covenant provides that promise that I am going to uphold the earth to accomplish my plan. Okay? So in it, it doesn't promise forgiveness of sins. It doesn't promise anything like that. It just promises he's going to sustain the earth. So it provides the stage, if you will, for the covenants to, uh, to further reveal themselves out. So that's why we sense the Abrahamic is built upon the Noahic as well. Notice every step is kind of built upon each other, leading us up to uh, where we're going to look at today. Did you have a question, Cosmo? Yeah, yeah. Is there, if you're actually speaking, is there any confusion between the covenant of David that's sort of like a maturing, uh, knowing that we're doing this grace? Right. So grace is definitely communicated in these covenants, for sure. Um, and that's why many will call it the covenant of grace. Uh, grace is communicated. And I would argue they're building upon one another. So there's still, there's still a di different, unique covenant, but it's building upon the previous covenant. Okay, so in Abraham, God promises all, all his seed. There will be a seed who will come. They're all going to be numerous. The nations will be blessed, right? And we see in Genesis 17 that kings will come from this seed. Okay, so that's a very, I will do these things, right? You know, I'm going to give you this thing. I'm going to, you know, that's very gracious, so we look at this and we see lots of grace in Abraham, and that, that gracious element is meant to point us forward to the covenant of grace. It, but, so by way of promise, as they're, as they're looking to that and attaching, it, to, attaching to that promise by faith, they are participating in this covenant um, before it's even come in time and space. So what we're going to see is the blood of the cross has to be spilt in order for forgiveness of sins to actually be accomplished. And then the benefits will go retrospective. But also in Abraham, we see conditions, too. Uh, you must, his son must be circumcised or else they're cut off. Um, and so this is very much a, a, a do this and live kind of emphasis here. And so that also, as this points us forward or points us yeah, ahead, the law element here points us back. Points us back to the need of the covenant works to be fulfilled. The standard still remains. 
law, perfect, perpetual, personal obedience. And the reason that's there is to show your son must be perfect and he must obey on my behalf. So it's pointing us back to the need of this. And the reason that's important is because when Christ comes, it talks about he's born what? Under the law, right? So he's going to have to fulfill the law. So in some sense, this has to be communicated once again in some form. It's not exactly the same because we're not, all, we're not sinless anymore, um, and, and, but the, the standard's still there. Perfect, personal, perpetual obedience. And Christ coming under this is going to do all the law aspects for us. He's going to earn the righteousness. He's the, he's the one who's going to do that. Um, so we see a lot of grace here. We still see law here. And we see the do this and live principle within that in order to enjoy the blessings of that covenant. Now, the reason God doesn't give everything all at once is, one, when he gives that, Abraham isn't a nation yet. He doesn't have numerous people. He's not in the land yet. So he doesn't need all the extra rules to govern him in the land. So once you have, you know, 400-something years later, they're in Egypt. God comes to Moses. He has Moses come out. He brings the people out of the land. He takes them into the wilderness. And then we see the establishment of the Mosaic Covenant. In the Mosaic Covenant, he gives them the laws. He gives them ceremonial laws for cleansing, which we talked about last time, where it's a picture of, of, of purification of the flesh. Um, you might have heard something similar to this. Um, Israel is, um, some people like to talk about uh, the, the church. Uh, and would say Israel is the old covenant church, and, the, new co- and the, the church today is a new covenant church. Where actually, how the Baptists would articulate that is they would say Israel's a type, with the church being the anti-type. It's meant to point us forward to that, um, to that reality. So it's a picture of something greater. Um, in Moses, you see a lot of law, right? And some have mistakenly just called this a covenant of works. Now, I know what they're trying to say. There's a do this and live principle. There's a lot of do this and live principles. The problem is it's not the covenant works, right? We're not saying it's this here. Um, and in so doing, they're also neglecting the gracious element that we see in Moses. There's very much grace in Moses. For instance, in the covenant of works, uh, how much times did it take for them to sin before God kicked them out? Once. Once, and they were out. Now, God does give a promise, but they're still expelled from the garden right away. In Moses, he gives them the conditions, but God is gracious to them. Uh, We can say there's this kindness that he shows to them that he is very patient. He allows them, even in their disobedience over and over. Right when God gives Moses the the covenant and the commandments, the people are already sinning, creating a golden calf. Right, And so he could have very well uh, wiped them out. Um, he would have been perfectly just to do so. But he's also holding to his promises of, I will do these things. So we see the gracious element that he's, he's willing to be patient. He's willing to renew the covenant. He's willing to give pictures of forgiveness through the sacrifices and priests. And all those things, the gracious element of that, right? The law, Paul would say the law is meant to drive us to Christ. It shows our inability. We are not able to do it. And in that sense, all those gracious elements point us to the need of the, uh, point us forward to the promise of the covenant of grace. That's to come. There's going to be something greater, not like the covenant I made with their fathers. Something much greater, as we're going to see in Jeremiah talk about. And um, in so doing, we do see the do this and live principle once again, right? They must obey. They must walk in the statutes in order. And as we saw, we saw the connection between Abraham and Moses. If they are to enjoy the Abrahamic promises, uh, the land which God will establish, the Moses, Moses governed those things, how they are to continue enjoyment in the land. So we see the law. They must obey the law. They must do those statutes. They must do the sacrifices. So all this stuff they must do, eventually the Lord's patience does run out and they are expelled from the land. But it's not exactly the same. That's why I don't want to say, oh, the, the Moses is just covenant works. It's dichotomous. There's, there's law uh, that points us back to the need of that to be fulfilled. It reflects it, but there's also grace. Okay? Um, David will further build upon what Moses says 
Um, and David is really um, built upon also the Abrahamic. Remember, in Genesis 17, he promises there will be kings that come from you. When we get to the Mo- uh, Mosaic Covenant, he says this is what the king must do before they even had kings. So all these covenants are anticipating something greater to come. So the king is to govern the people. The king is to uh, obey the law. He's to have the, the, the covenant in his chambers, and he's to read them. He's to obey them. And as the king goes, the people goes. As the king is righteous and, and does the good things in the sight of the Lord, the people are blessed. They get to enjoy. You read the Psalms, and it talk a lot about uh, the king as the anointed one, the one who the Lord will bring salvation, the one who the Lord's behind. Well, in their first understanding of that, that was their present king. That was the one who was to do those things. But as we know, that was a human king who was sinful, who uh, would eventually uh, not be perfect and would eventually die. And so that first level fulfillment of those kings that they had was meant to point forward to a greater king who will uh, establish the throne of David forever, um, who will sit on that throne forever. And another thing, they were called to obey that law. That's why I was in their chambers. And it also talked about, we saw those passages, if they didn't do this, then those sons were cut off. God is still going to establish the line of David. He's still going to put a king on the throne. Just that king who disobeyed, who would be cut off, he doesn't participate in that anymore. And so that, show, again, shows us the need of the law to be fulfilled. And what we, these are establishing for us is that we need a greater king. We need a greater prophet. We need one who's going to come and earn the blessing so we can finally rest in the land once and for all and secure. And God gave, according to the Old Covenant, we see, even see in Joshua, he gave them all that he promised. Um, But, in a second level fulfillment of these things, uh, there was something greater. It pointed to something greater. Okay, so we see these gracious elements, and we see the law elements of the do this and live. Okay, and like I said, there's different mixtures of law and grace within this. Um, We also see another thing is we see the spiritual as well as a... um, a fleshly people that are within this. So there's promises that are made to a literal fleshly people, right, that get to partake because they're just Abraham's uh, biological seed. But there's also, we see in a greater sense, a spiritual seed um, that is there. We see this throughout the Old Covenant as well. So that's what we're looking at here. Now, as these covenants play out, Um, There is kind of another covenant that we've talked about before, but um, that kind of helps us understand everything together, and that's the covenant of redemption, okay? And the reason I just want to go over that is because it's very closely tied into the covenant of grace. Um, Some have mistakenly just said, oh, it's all the same thing, but as we go through it, you're going to see that these are completely different parties. It's a different covenant, but they are closely related, Um, And so we'll look at a little bit at that, and then I want to look at the New Covenant. This is going to be two parts here. So Um, any questions just on what we've looked at so far? I know a lot of that was review, and a lot of that's on our recordings too. So Remember, I'm not saying this is what you have to believe. I'm just saying this is an expression of Baptist covenant theology, and it's good for us to understand and wrestle with what they were looking at. But they wrote it in a way, in the 1689, they wrote it in a way to where we can look at that and just say, maybe you hold to the one-substance different administration model. You can still affirm there's a progressive revelation that centers on Christ. Okay? So this is another model that was behind the 1689 that I think is helpful for us to understand. And it gives a particularly Baptistic argument because we understand uh, the differences between these covenants here. Um, it's not one and the same to where we need to carry in the sign over uh, exactly how we saw it here. It's a new covenant, something different. So that's what we're going to see here. All right, any questions, comments? All right, so let's look at a little bit at the covenant of redemption. Um, and this here is just, uh, do you remember how we defined it when we kind of gave the overview 
um, week, months ago. This is the inter-Trinitarian covenant that was given before the foundations of the world. So we can look at passages like Genesis, or not Genesis, um, uh, well, Genesis, you can say the let us make man. You know, who is, who is he talking to? Um, I would argue that is part of that covenant redemption. He's talking to the Trinitarian there, the Trinity there, and uh, they're talking about the creation according to what they planned. Um, Another thing we see here is in Ephesians, when we see uh, Paul going over the blessings of salvation, he talks about before the foundations of the world, the Father elected, the Son was given a commission to go and redeem. And again, so we can look by uh, consequence, uh, looking at Scripture, deducing these things, and and we can conclude, okay, there was something before the foundations of the world that's kind of different between the covenants we see here. That was between the Godhead just to work for the plan of salvation. Um, so the parties of the covenants would then be who? Titus 1-2, Paul says, eternal life was promised before the ages began. Okay? Um, so there's this eternal uh, reality of a purpose plan that was there before the foundations of the world. Now, we being human, finite creatures, limited by time, have a hard time uh, trying to figure out our mind around this. Thinking, well, how can God, who is not bound by time, you know, how did this happen? And it just always has eternally been. It's not like they, you know, said, okay, we're going to meet at Starbucks and we're going to have a meeting about this and we're going to go over the different roles. Um, this is just something we see as a reflection as we read Scripture and we can conclude these things. Um, Paul says this also. We read this in 2 Timothy 1.9. Before the ages began, he had a purpose given in Christ. So the parties of the covenant then, and this is why I say it's different from the covenant of grace. So they are very similar. Um, the, so you can see the orange line here is the whole plan. Everything. Everything that we've been talking about is the plan before the foundations of the world. So we can say plan, okay, all this is now put into time and space and worked out, okay? Now, the parties of this is between the Godhead, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. They make commitments, pledges to one another out of love. The Son isn't forced. He voluntarily, because he loves his Father, wants to, wants to do these things. Isaiah 42 says, Behold my servant, whom I uphold, my chosen, in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He'll bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice and make it heard in the streets. A bruised reed he will not break. Faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged. So he's established justice in the earth and the coastlands. Thus says the Lord who created the heavens and the earth and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people on it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I will take you by the hand and keep you. I will give you as a covenant for the people, a light for the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeons, from the prisons, those who sit in darkness. This is again emphasized in Isaiah 49, uh, 8 and 9 as well. So we see this servant who... The Lord, we can say the Father, is putting forward, and this is a servant who is the covenant for the people, a life for the nations, and he has a mission, a task, that he is coming on in earth to do. Um, in Isaiah 50, verse 4 through 9, it talks about the, the son's willingness to go and do those things. Um, it says, the Lord has opened my ear, and I was not rebellious, I would not turn back. Um, and you can, you know, continue to keep reading that. Um, it talks about that. He's going he's gonna to do that. He says, Behold, the Lord God helps me. Who will declare me guilty? Behold, all of them will wear out like a garment from moth will eat them up. So the servant's given a task. He voluntarily goes to fulfill this task. And then Jesus, what did he say when he quotes this passage in, in, uh, in Luke 4? Right? He looked at the scroll. He says, he quotes, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. 
because he had anointed me to, plan, to proclaim good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering the sight to the blind. Right? He rolled it up, sat down, and said, that's fulfilled in your hearing. I am the servant who has come to do this, and I am accomplishing it. He didn't continue reading everything that talked about the judgment he's also going to do, but for what he was going to do at that time and, and place in his incarnation, that was being fulfilled in their hearing. He's saying, I am the servant, and I am being obedient. So father and son are presented as these parties we see in our confession as well. And remember when we were going through, um, I believe, doctrine of God, we see these things. If you look at chapter 7 as well, earlier on you can see this covenant between the father and son, I believe 7, paragraph 1 maybe. Um, but the Holy Spirit is also present as well throughout this. Um, the Holy Spirit is, is there, we see in the beginning of creation, right, hovering over, over the chaotic waters. Uh, also, the, he, the Son is then anointed and given the ability to do the miraculous signs and wonders by virtue of the Holy Spirit. Um, he's given a special uh, allotment of the Spirit. And this talks about this in a Trinitarian covenant. And we can go through numerous other scriptures that talk about this dialogue that they have between one another. But uh, what we see is, is uh, there's this plan before the foundations of the world to go about these things. Um, they make commitments to one another as well. Um, and we went through some of those things. Psalm 110 describes the Lord appointing his servant as a priest. Right? Psalm 61 is that servant song which describes the servant as the one who receives and delivers the word of God. Um, so he's going to be a prophet. Um, Psalm 2, kiss the son, right? He's going to be the one who rules the nations and who also brings judgment as well. Um, and so in so doing, we see that God has a purpose to bring about the redemption and it's presented in the form of covenant. Um, in John 10, we see the son's commitment to his mission, right? He says, I will lay down my life and take it up again. Whoever believes in me will live. And he talks about the sheep. He's the shepherd. He's coming to do these things. Um, Hebrews, one, uh, Hebrews 7 talks about uh, he is a priest, a priesthood, because he mediates a better covenant. And then in light of this, in, in Isaiah 53, we also see he's going to suffer. And we also see at the end of that, in, in verses 10 to 12, what happens after he suffers? Well, he's... He's raised. He's given the reward for accomplishment of what he, of accomplishment of his task, which we would argue that's the resurrection, that's his ascension, that's his giving of the throne was the reward because he came and accomplished the mission. Well, how do we know what those that was? How do we know the commitments? Well, covenant of redemption. So we hear when we say covenant of grace, um, we understand that in light of. In light of the covenant of redemption, we can say we understand what Christ was given to do. We understand his, his role. He accomplished it so that we, he accomplished all the, that was assigned to him. And in so doing, the benefits that we get to enjoy are part of the covenant of grace. So what for us is a covenant of grace, we can understand for him was very much a do this and live. He, he did this so he could live and, and earn blessing for all who, who are sharing in his um, union. So he earns the reward. He earns everything that um, he didn't. He didn't. He, he took upon the covenant curses of the failure of the covenant works. He died for us because that's what we were bound under. So he was the one who did this and lived for us. Okay, any questions on this covenant of redemption? I know we went over that before, so just kind of a little brief here. You understand there's a distinction between why we're saying they're different, the parties? Right. From the, so, yeah, this, what happened in the garden isn't plan B, you know. 
um, sending Christ, oh, well, Adam failed. I guess I need to go and do this. It was all the original plan for Christ to come and redeem. Um, so we can, you know, when we look at this, we can really see God's sovereignty and the whole aspect of creation and everything that we've looked at. None of this was an accident. He was working out his plan um, for his son to come and redeem. Good. Any other questions on that? In Luke 1 as well, Mary kind of looks at those, those things. Luke 1.35, uh, she's told that the incarnation will take place by the Holy Spirit. So another indication that the Holy Spirit is definitely involved in the ministry of Christ as well and had commitments to that. And, and it was fulfilled. Jesus was raised from the dead. Uh, we know that this this was, was this was accomplished because Hebrews 10 he offered for one time all time a single sacrifice for sin and sat down at the right hand until his enemies should be made a footstool. That's the promise of Psalm 2. It, it happened. Christ was raised. He is ruling, and then he will come again as well. Okay, so that brings us to the covenant of grace. Um, the covenant of grace here. And the covenant of grace um, is what we talked about is everyone who has ever been saved has been saved by virtue of this covenant alone, the covenant of grace. Um, as you can see how I drew it, it's, it's always been in effect. It just hasn't been in reality of, in time and space because it hadn't been ratified yet on the cross. Covenants... This uh, new covenant in particular, Christ says this is the blood of the covenant. Um, well, what covenant is the one that gives forgiveness of sins? It comes only by virtue of the one where he's the federal head. And if he says this is the blood of the new covenant, then the new covenant, we would say, is the covenant of grace because the covenant of grace is the only covenant by which you can have forgiveness, true forgiveness of sins. Um, and so let's turn to Hebrews 8. Now, with this kind of understanding, you can see how this can help you better interpret Scripture as well. So when you come to Galatians, I don't think what Paul is doing is pitting, pitting Moses against Abraham. Uh, I don't think that's really what he's doing. He's, he's using category of Old Covenant, New Covenant. And it's going to better help us understand some of these things as well as we get into this. Um, Hebrews 8 says this, But as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than than the old. What is the old? Well, we would say Abraham, Moses, David. It's the old covenant that governs Israel. Um, why? As the covenant he mediates is better, since it is enacted on better promises. So what promises make that better than what we see in the old covenant? Um, and the nature that it goes on to talk about in Hebrews is the nature of the blood spilled. Uh, in the Old Covenant, what did blood sprinkled on the people represent? Right, The priest would do this. It's an outward right, an outward way to say, okay, um, here's what you're to do. This represents forgiveness. It represents your commitment to the covenant. Um, so there was blood spilled in the Old Covenant through blood of bulls and goats and all those things, and they communicated something to the people. Uh, think very first level fulfillment. Let's not jump straight to Christ just yet. Um, the blood of the Old Covenant that's sprinkled on the people, blood only cleansed them outwardly. Um, we talk about this in Hebrews where it talks about it was for the purification of the flesh. In the New Covenant, though, the blood of Christ is spilled and actually cleanses people who it's applied to once and for all. It, it really forgives. It cleanses sins. Uh, this is legally only could have been established when the blood was actually spilt. Which was when? Well, at the cross. And so what Baptists argue is the new covenant is the covenant of grace realized in time and space. Because that's where the, the covenant was ratified in blood. Where, where the promises of forgiveness actually were accomplished. 
before, you have the gracious elements that are merely just promising and anticipating and looking forward to that, but it didn't actually provide it yet until it's been enacted in time and space. Now, the people are participating in these sacrifices and promises and are looking to it by faith. Those that are doing it by faith are in a second level fulfillment, ultimately looking to what it promised. That's why we say um, from shadow to substance. Okay? So this was a shadow. It wasn't the substance. And this is the substance in reality. So that's a big difference that we're going to talk about between Baptist covenant theology and Presbyterian kind of model of covenant theology or Westminster Federalism. Um, because you hear one substance, different administration, right? Which means Abraham, Moses, David, new covenant. That's all the covenant grace. The same substance. What is the substance? If we're to define substance, what, what would that be? You know, just be thinking of these categories. We're going to touch on this. We're going to look at verses. What would that be? How is that communicated? What are the promises of those? So we're going to wrestle with those. Um, again, going back to the better promises, the blood. Uh, Sam says this in his book. It's on page 198. It says, As the old covenant was inaugurated with the ritual blood, so was the new. But the blood of Christ cleanses once and for all. The benefits of the covenantal sacrifice were enjoyed throughout history, but the legal establishment of it took place at the end of the ages. Hebrews 9.25. The death of Christ establishes his people in the new covenant on the basis of the perfect and permanent sacrifice. Okay, so we see some of this in, in Romans 4 as well. Um, in Romans 4, uh, David knew that he needed to be cleansed. And he looked forward to something greater by which he, he, would, uh, he would be cleansed. Um, Notice in verse 6, Just as David also speaks of the one to whom God counts righteous apart from works, blessed are those whose lawless deeds are forgiven, whose sins are covered. Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Is this blessing only for the circumcised? Also for the uncircumcised. For we say that faith was counted to Abraham as righteous. How then was it counted to him? It was before or after he'd been circumcised. It was not after. He was, circum he was circumcised. He received the sign as a seal to the faith that he had. So David's looking forward to this when he's in his sin, when he's looking for forgiveness. It, it's not the old covenant that was providing that forgiveness, ultimately. Um, surely there was tons of things that were slaughtered, but according to the law, he very well should have been killed uh, for his immorality. Um, surely there was a lot of blood spilt for his sins, but ultimately, he looked forward to something greater that would actually be provide that forgiveness of sins. Uh, he was looking to seeing what those sacrifices ultimately pictured. Um, Blessed is the man against whom the Lord will not count his sin. Um, cleansing comes from blood, is what David saw. Cleansing comes from blood, and the blood of bulls and goats didn't cleanse. Um, it, it purified the flesh. Um, the body of Jesus, or the blood of Jesus, sorry, we would say, was retrospective. So when it happened, all these things, all the sacrifices, everything that promised, you know, forgiveness, cleanliness, all these things, they did purification of the flesh for a national aspect because it was a type, it was type, typological of the church, how they participated in it. There needed to be some kind of sacrifice. As they're participating in these things, it pictured restoration. It pictured uh, cleanliness, and it came by way of blood, right? That was even what was communicated in Genesis 3.15, right? God had to kill an animal for them to give skin, for them to be covered for their nakedness. Something had to shed its blood. That was a picture. But nothing truly forgave sins, it, what what uh, Peter talks about is God passed over their sins in a time to where he would actually forgive it by putting their sins on Christ. So once his blood is shed, all the Old Testament saints who believed in those promises and there were truth, had true faith, right? We would say the remnant of Israel, the true Israel. Because um, there are still some in Israel who went through all the ceremonial 
actions, who went through all the purification rituals, who were not legitimately having true faith. The, the, the things that that communicated to them was merely purification of the flesh. Right? So if they accidentally touched a dead corpse, they had to go through this purification ceremony, and then they could be come back into the fold. It showed this idea of uncleanliness and cleanliness. Um, but that was to communicate something greater. Something has to happen in order for us to be clean. Okay? And it's the blood of Christ that cleanses us from all our sins. So those who had true faith, who were latching onto the gracious promises we talked about, got to participate in the covenant of grace retrospectively because the blood covers all past and future. Okay, so I give this analogy often. Um, I have to uh, we'll, we'll take the youth bowling. And, um, you know, we have four kids go in front of me, and there's you know, four kids behind me. I'm in the middle, and I'm paying for everyone. And the kids go up, and they get their shoes. They say, okay, he's paying, he's paying, he's paying. I haven't paid in reality yet. I haven't done anything. But the cashier lets them go, have their shoes, everything. And so then I come, I pay for everybody. And then everyone after me, too, says, he paid, he paid, he paid. And the, cre- the cashier credits them all with that. But I didn't actually pay in time and space until... I would actually paid for it at the cashier line. In a similar fashion, these people go all before Christ who looked in faith, who are basically, by faith, looked, saying he's going to pay. We're trusting in that. When Christ comes on the cross, he sheds his blood. That's the only way you can have true forgiveness of sins. He pays, and they get to participate in the true forgiveness. And then everyone who comes after the cross, we look forward, we have the full understanding of, of what he actually did because we have the fullness of the word of God. We understand that who he was and how what the works he did. They just had types and pictures of that. But they looked through these gracious elements by faith. And once the cross, Christ accomplished the payment on the cross by the shedding of his blood, then God had just passed over former sins and now he actually paid for them in full. Once and for all. So that's why we can say, you know, all our sins, past, present, and even future, are covered by the blood of Christ. It's not like he had to be slaughtered every single time, right? We're not Catholics where we're actually doing a mass here for the forgiveness of your sins. We're saying, remember, remember what he's done. Remember the payment's been paid in full. You have forgiveness, and because of that, that should motivate our obedience and love and gratitude for him. So let's partake of these and remember what he's done for us. Um, And so it's a once-for-all sacrifice there. Um, in Hebrews 9, 9.26, if you want to turn there real quick, it says, speaking of this, uh, speaking of Jesus, nor was it offered him, nor did he offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters the holy place every year with the blood not his own. For then he would have to suffer repeatedly since the foundation of the world. But as it is, he has appeared once for all, at the end of the age, to put away sin by the sacrifice of himself. One sacrifice at, for the end of the forgiveness of sins for all people throughout all ages. Um, Romans 3.35 brings that up, um, that they were uh, passed over as well until Christ came. Okay? So going back to, uh, Kevin asked a question last time, uh, two weeks ago, about those things being efficacious, right? And so just to kind of hit on that, the, the Old Testament sacrifices in themselves didn't, um, didn't, didn't forgive the sins. It, caught, it showed the purification of the flesh. But as the true people who had true faith looked at those things by faith, then those things for what they that what they pictured by way of typology were efficacious because it was pointing them ultimately to that. So they were looking, you know, we call this shadow. You have the tree here. The tree's casting a dim shadow over here. In reality, they're right here. They're looking at the shadow. They don't see the shadow in, in and of themselves as, hey, awesome, this is the actual thing. No, it points them to the greater reality. And those who have true faith, ultimately, that's what they were doing. 
They were looking to something, a truer reality, that is casting that shadow. Um, and that's what provided the efficacious uh, forgiveness of sins. Um, so we can see also the foundation of this new covenant is ultimately the covenant of redemption. That's why I wanted to just briefly touch on it. it we see that what Christ is going to do, he can accomplish. We see it in time and space, he can actually doing those things. Right? Yeah, so that's a good good segue there to um, say next week we will we'll talk about the newness of the new covenant, and uh, and we'll, we'll look at that, and then I want us to look at the blessings of that new covenant as well, and then we're going to parallel it with the blessings and promises of this, and see if they're different. So, anyways, let's go ahead and pray. I know there's people already, so we'll get ready for service. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time and thank you for all you're doing and. Uh, Lord, we just are enamored with your great salvation. Uh, we see this played out in the scriptures, and Lord, we're just seeking to better understand, not for mere knowledge or or uh, to win an argument, but just to um, be able to articulate in a concise way to better understand our Bibles and to interpret them and uh, to give you all the glory. Because it's as we understand these things, Christ is the one who gets all the glory. We are just participants caught up in this great love story of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So, Lord, we pray that uh, you would help us to just uh, give you the glory in these things and to humble ourselves and rest in Christ. We pray in his name. Amen.